So before I jump into the message this morning, let me kind of take off my preacher hat for a moment and put on my senior minister hat and kind of share a little bit uh, with you. Um, you may or may not have noticed over the past few weeks, we've been running into some technical issues. Uh, if you've tried to worship with us online, we've had real issues there. Um, I want to first say a, a big thank you to our, our production team. They work hard um, every single week. Yeah. Um, and most of, uh, probably the majority of the things they're having to address rather than it's like not so much the wrong button got pushed. It's a thing that's just kind of come about and they're having to figure out and learn and discover ways to fix things. And so if you see things kind of going haywire, that's probably why. So have some patience and some grace like I know you guys do. Um, also know if you, you know, sometimes we look forward to being able to get online if we're traveling or if we're not able to be here on a Sunday and try and catch up later on, we do our best to get those on there. And so sometimes if it's just not there, that's why uh, we'll do our best to try and have those things available because it's important. We walk this weird kind of tightrope within doing these things that we don't want it to be a thing that it's a, the most important thing is that God gets the focus and we get our hearts tuned to him. We grow in him, but we also want to do things with, with excellence and we want to do our best with these things. And so we want to make sure that uh, we don't allow ourselves to kind of get pulled away from the things that are most important. Um, and so sometimes that's when we kind of have to just say sorry to this or that. And so if you, if you, something's missing, or not there, and you're like, oh, where was that? We probably had to pull the plug on something uh, for, the, for the, the greater good. All right, moving on. Have you ever been called the black sheep before? Or have you ever called someone else the black sheep? This concept of being the black sheep of a group or a family or whatever it might be, it's centuries old, and it comes from Sheep breeding, duh, right? Uh, farmers would do their best to provide or, or to produce flocks with sheep of all of the exact same color. But, but every once in a while, uh, a sheep would, would show up, would be born into the flock that didn't match. And a lot of times it would be a black sheep. This sheep would be you know, starkly different from the rest of the group. Um, and, and sometimes shepherds even began to think of it as kind of a curse or a bad thing on them. Eventually the phrase, the black sheep, kind of started to be used for people that stood out in a group for whatever reason, uh, good, bad, and different, or whatever, even eventually it kind of took on the connotation, the idea of being kind of like the bad one amongst the group. And even the person that maybe didn't turn out quite like parents or teachers or bosses or whatever had hopes in mind. Well, today, as Jeremy mentioned, we're going to look at kind of the black sheep of the group of the 12, uh, the one that stands out amongst the rest of the group, and, and not in a good way standing out amongst the rest of the group, not in a way of rising to the top or impressing others, but of being kind of the one. Today, as we look at Judas, we're going to see that. And the wild thing that we're going to see about Judas is that he had the same opportunities. He had the same setup as the others. He had the same potential but there was an important element missing within his life and his heart that unfortunately kind of set him apart as being the black sheep. Now, let's kind of remember for a moment the whole point of this series that we're looking at. You know, we are looking at the 12. If you, if you remember from maybe studying the Bible on your own, that Jesus had a lot of followers. And to be a disciple, and it's very basic root idea, is to be a follower of Jesus. And you could argue about, well, how much do you have to follow Jesus to be a disciple? I mean, we could spend forever kind of arguing about that. And that's not the point. In fact, there were at one time for Jesus, literally, there were thousands and thousands of people who followed him, who wanted to see something and get something out of him or from him. And then it, but then there came a point where Jesus selected just 12 guys, it said, to be with him and so that he could also send them out. They're also called apostles for that reason. But we've been looking at, at these different disciples with the hope that we could see something within them, something within their story, something within the way that they related and, and were with Jesus, with the real hope that we could also see something from us. Maybe see some of our own shortcomings, see some of our own issues, and some, see some different things in there that we could learn and grow from. And maybe in this series, you've seen yourself. Maybe the first week you saw yourself with, in Peter's story, and the way that Peter was the one that swung for the fence and so often came up short. You know, he gave it his all, but so many times, man, he missed the picture, missed the bigger point. Or maybe you saw yourself within Matthew. Matthew was the outsider. He was the one that really didn't fit into the group, but Jesus called him into the group. 
Maybe you've seen yourself in Thomas. Thomas was the one that forevermore will be labeled the doubter, but really Thomas just wanted to find the truth, and he wanted to discover it for himself. Maybe you see yourself in James. James, remember, was the guy that he and his brother John, they were real passionate, but unfortunately their passion went too far sometimes, and they used it in ways that God didn't intend. Or maybe you see yourself, like last week we saw, in his brother John. And the way that John, even though he had this reputation, he wanted so desperately to be known as the one that Jesus loved. He wanted this new identity. He was a changed person. Today, though, you may even still see yourself in Judas. And our hope is today is to look at Judas and the situations or the times that he's mentioned in the Gospels and for us to kind of make some observations about those situations, kind of get a clear picture of what's going on. But then in the end, I hope to kind of bring out some important lessons from Judas and even from his interactions in his life and even from some of the bad choices that he made. The first place we're going to look at is in John chapter 6. It says this in verse 70. It says, Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve, Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. You see, Judas didn't come to this group any different than the rest of them. It wasn't like he kind of like snuck into this group. It wasn't like he sort of like uh, padded his resume with the HR department and somehow got a job that he wasn't qualified for. No, he was chosen by Jesus. Sometimes we can find ourselves in these kind of situations that maybe we shouldn't be there. My dad, for some reason, has a knack for not like stumbling into situations, but to step into situations he really should not be places. Kind of like being on the other side of the rope or other side of the fence that he should not be there doesn't belong there, but somehow he gets it there. Drives my mom insane. And he'll say to you, he says, just act like you're supposed to be there and no one will question you. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes it works out. You just pretend like you're supposed to be there and you just roll with it. And people are like, oh, okay, well, there goes that guy. And there's lots of, there's lots of stories that I could tell you some other time about times that he has done that. But that wasn't the situation with Judas. He didn't kind of like somehow sneak into this group of 12 guys being with Jesus. No, Judas was chosen by Jesus. Jesus chose Judas. And even though he knew who Judas really was, and even though he knew what Judas would eventually do, Jesus still chose him. It wasn't like Jesus saw this guy Judas and was kind of like, well, you know, maybe this guy would be a good addition to the group. And Jesus was kind of like oblivious to what was going to go on and what he would eventually do. No, Jesus even said of this group, one of you is a devil. Now, this term devil, it, it kind of has uh, a connotation. If you go back to the original Greek um, of how the New Testament was written in Greek, the word that was used there for devil here kind of has this connotation of being an accuser or a slanderer or someone who the things he says just aren't true. And so it's not that Jesus is saying that Judas is the devil, but what he's saying about Judas is that someone who doesn't speak the truth, doesn't know the truth. There was another time that Judas was associated with the devil, though. Uh, it's during the Last Supper that Jesus is spending time with his disciples. They're there celebrating the Passover meal together, and Jesus tells his disciples that one of them would betray him. And, and of course, as you can imagine, they all deny it. They're all like, well, it's not going to be me. And they even begin to ask Jesus, well, Jesus, who, who is it that's going to betray you? And you see this in John 13, 26. Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread, and when I, have dipped it in, when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dip in the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Again, Jesus, Jesus knew and was fully aware, even though the other disciples were confused about like, okay, well, I mean, to them, it would make sense that, well, we've all been together and we've been supporting Jesus. Surely Judas is with us, but Jesus knew his heart. He knew what was going on and yet he still chose him, which I think is a powerful realization. And you would think that maybe that would mean that by Judas being there with Jesus and seeing Jesus serve people and hearing him teach people and watching him heal people, you would think that that would mean it would change Judas. But unfortunately, Judas refused to change. He refused to allow it to 
affect his heart and change who he really was deep down. In fact, we even see an example of this in John chapter 12. It says this in verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with this fragrant, the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Now, even though this is more than halfway into John's gospel account of Jesus' life and ministry, we already see that John's record is already into the last week of Jesus' life. And so that means that by the time that this event that we just read has happened, Judas would have spent years with Jesus. So it's not like a thing of like, you know, like how sometimes you come to church and you, you maybe you're here for about an hour, hour, 15 minutes or whatever. And then sometimes something comes up, so you're not able to make it to church. And so you're not there all the time. That, that, that's not the case with Judas. No, he was spending all of his time with Jesus. I mean, they lived together. They traveled together. They ate together. They even were persecuted together. They experienced the Pharisees and the religious leaders trying to bring Jesus down. They also experienced the miracles of Jesus together. Everything from seeing thousands and thousands of people fed two different times and even seeing him heal and raise dead people back to life. They even experienced him calming a storm when they were in a boat with Jesus and even watched him cast demons out of a guy and send them into a pig, herd of pigs. But even with all of that, seeing all that, experiencing all that, going through all of that, Judas refused to change. He had a hard heart. So hard that when this, this woman shows up, Mary, when she shows up and humbly worships Jesus in this, in this manner by anointing him with perfume, Judas gets upset about it. And, and did you catch what it said why he was upset. It wasn't because he was upset, even though he said, oh, we could have sold that and given to the poor. That wasn't the reason he was upset. He was probably more upset that the money hadn't been just given to Jesus so he could skim a little bit off the top. And it just blows my mind that Judas could experience so much, but have no kind of heart change after all of that. And there are many today, I think, who are in the same boat, in the same situation, they refuse to allow God to change their heart. And maybe they see God do something in their life. Maybe they see God bless them or heal them or even do some kind of miracle. But then it's like we want to turn it around back into uh, making it all about how we wish it would have been done and making it all about us. Well, why couldn't it have happened this way, God? Why couldn't you have done these things, made it a whole lot easier or made this better for me? Why couldn't you have you know, done these things and made it so much more uh, better for my family or whatever it might be? And we make it all about ourselves, just like Judas was doing, taking that powerful moment and turning it back to what he wanted and what he preferred. We miss what's really going on, all because we don't allow our heart to be changed. And I think all of that happened within Judas because Judas had the wrong focus. He had the wrong focus. When, when Mary shows up at that meal with the perfume, he's frustrated because he said that the money could have been used in a different way, totally missing the bigger picture, totally missing this powerful act of worship from this, this broken woman. He saw the money and not the worship. And not only that, we even see that in, in Matthew and Mark's accounts in their gospels, when they record this situation right after this moment, right after this, what should be a powerful and beautiful moment of worship, we see that this is recorded in Matthew 26 and verse 14. It says, then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. Then Judas, then, from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So Judas goes from this, 
what should have been a powerful and beautiful moment of this woman worshiping Jesus in a humbling and sacrificial way. And he leaves there unchanged, untouched, unaffected by it. And he goes to the priests and he asks the question, hey, what do you give me? What will you give me? And man, I, I think so often that is the question of the day for so many of us. Whether we state it verbally or if we just think it, or if it just kind of rolls through our head, we ask the question, well, what will you give me? How will this profit me? It's like we are so willing to put up our soul and our allegiance to the highest bidder of what it will profit us. I mean, we give our allegiance to things like career because it seems like it has the most promise for financial gain. We give our allegiance to a group of people who will accept us for who I want to be and who I think I should be in my life. We even give our allegiance on behalf of our children to things that we're so convinced is so good for them, but maybe it's more about our own ego and how it makes us feel as parents. And it's all based on us and what it will profit us. Just like Judas, what will you give me? What can you do for me? Make it worth my wild. And this thing, you know, it, 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 should, it should blow our minds, though, that the one thing that could have been given to Judas, the one thing that mattered the most out of all the things, the thing that would last the most, that would give him the most confidence, that would pay off the most in the long run, Jesus was the one that could have provided that for him. And he could have simply gone to Jesus and just said, listen, uh, you have everything that I need and I just want to get it from you. But no, he goes to the religious leaders, the influential people of the day, and he goes to them and says, hey, what can you do for me? How can you make it worth my while? And most likely the reason that Judas had the wrong focus as a disciple is that Judas never accepted Jesus as Lord. He never accepted him as Lord. What I mean is that I think when Judas looked at Jesus, he saw him as a teacher. He saw him as a healer, probably even saw him as a prophet, but never as his Lord. And you can even see evidence in the, in the way that Judas would talk to Jesus sometimes. We see it, uh, we see the situation where after the Last Supper, um, or at the Last Supper, when Jesus is kind of saying to his disciples, hey, one of you is going to betray me. And again, you remember they're, they're talking about, well, it's not going to be me. It's not going to be me. And, and Matthew records it like this in Matthew 26, 25. It says, then Judas, one of, one, the one who would betray him, said, surely you don't mean me, rabbi. And then either, even later on that night after the meal, while Jesus and his disciples, the rest of the 11, are at the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're praying, and Jesus is you know, deep in prayer and praying, you know, God, if there's any way this can be taken from me, but not my will, yours be done. And then the mob shows up with Judas, and we see the, the situation in verse 47. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. With, with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. Both times. He refers to Jesus as rabbi, meaning teacher. And that's all that, Jesus, or all that Judas saw Jesus as, a teacher. And sadly, there are many today that I think just see Jesus in that way. Well, he's a good teacher. He's got some really good principles that we should live by, but that's it. Not as Lord, not as King, not as God with flesh on come to earth to save us. Or I think many maybe go to that other extreme and use just that by itself. They see Jesus just simply as Savior. Like he came to save me and forgive my sins and hallelujah, amen, back to my life. He took away my sins. I'm good. I'm washed up. And we forget that we miss the whole point when all we do is just accept his forgiveness. And I think that's all that Judas was worried about, again, was what could it profit him? What could it do for him? And miss the whole point of Jesus being there. So what can we learn then from Judas's situations? A couple of things that I want us to kind of catch before we, before we leave Judas today. Three things, in fact. The first thing is that time with Jesus doesn't guarantee change. Just time with Jesus doesn't guarantee change. Now, I know some of you are thinking, now, wait a minute, Joe. For the past two weeks, you have really harped on us spending time with Jesus. And you said that's been so important. And yes, that's true. I did say that the past two weeks. 
But it's kind of like, think of it as that kid that maybe you've seen the pictures on the internet where he takes his, his textbook and he puts it under his pillow at night and he sleeps on that hoping that somehow just being, or, being his, around his textbook, having his head on his book is somehow going to like help him learn all his information by osmosis. It doesn't work that way, friends. Just, just being with Jesus isn't enough. In fact, just reading his word isn't enough. Just going to church isn't enough. Or just going through all the motions isn't enough. It's not a guarantee. In fact, we even see that Jesus talks about it in this way in Matthew 7, 21. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name or in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then he will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You know, we think about the Pharisees. We think about these religious leaders, and they, they didn't spend a lot of time with Jesus, but they did a whole lot of religious things. They went through the motions. They talk the talk. And they even, in many ways, walked the walk, but they never, they never really had any kind of real change about them. You see, just going through the motions, just being with Jesus in those times is not a guarantee. And so you may hear that then and say, okay, great. You know, so then what do I do then? If that's not the guarantee of doing those things, then what am I supposed to do? If, if being with Jesus isn't enough, if just reading the Bible or just praying or just going to church or doing some good deeds isn't enough, well, then what's the deal? Well, then what do I do? Well, you see, life change requires surrender. And I think that's really the key and what Judas was really missing was surrender. And surrender is so much more than just words, so much more than just saying, yes, you know, I surrender, I believe in Jesus. It's even so much more than like a mental assent or acknowledgement of God being real and Jesus really dying for me. It's so much more this is what Jesus says about surrender in Mark 8, 34. He says, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Author and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer once wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. Um, and in it, he talks about this idea of us. Sometimes we pursue this idea of cheap grace. The idea that we're willing and very happy to accept the forgiveness of Jesus. We love that idea, but when it comes to surrendering to Jesus, giving him our lives, well, you know, that's where we kind of get hung up a little bit. And that's where we kind of have a hard time of really giving ourselves over to him. And, and I got to tell you, sometimes this whole idea of surrender can really be a difficult thing. And it's hard for me to stand up here and to just simply say, well, surrender means this. Because surrender is going to mean a lot of different things in a lot of different ways for a lot of different people. Because there's going to be some things that you need to surrender to Jesus that I'm not even going to ever even like consider and there's going to be some things that I need to surrender to Jesus in my life that don't mean anything to you. And so for you, it means taking that time to pause, to give the time to Jesus and be able to say, show me what it is that I'm holding on to, that I'm clutching to so tightly. I was talking with someone this morning even um, who's kind of struggling with some things of surrender in, in her life. And she was saying that, you know, it's just, it's so difficult because she wants to be able to have just a very simple list, a very X, Y, and Z kind of thing of, I just, you know, do these things and I'm good to go. But she knows that's not how it is. Even when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, you don't always know where we're following to. When you follow someone, you just simply follow. So friends, I want to challenge you to take that time to think through, to pray through, Lord, what is it that I need to surrender? But the last thing that I want us to catch from Judas is really not even so much about Judas, but as a reminder that we see within Judas, a reminder about Jesus, and that is that Jesus loves the lost. Jesus loves the lost. So much so that Jesus called Judas just like the others. He spent time with Judas, 
just like the others. He taught Judas just like the others. He even sent Judas out with his other apostles just like the rest of them. And not only that, and I think that probably the moment that strikes me the greatest and hits me in a powerful way is that I think about the fact that he even washed Judas's feet the night that Judas was going to betray him, just like the others. In fact, if you go to John's gospel there in, in the account where they're in their upper room, they're celebrating the Passover meal, and it talks about these different things that Jesus knows. He knows that he's about to leave. He knows that his time is coming to an end. He knows he's about to return back to his father. He knows even that, that Judas has already betrayed him. And so what does he do? He gets up and he goes around to each and every single one of them and he washes their feet. Jesus loves the lost. And I would have to say that that needs to be a reminder to us of how we should love the lost just as much. Because I know sometimes we can look at the lost. We can look at at least the people that we want to label as lost. And there is a lot of labeling going on nowadays, okay? Uh, there's a lot of, we, and sometimes we, we act like, oh, I'm not into that crowd. No, we all do it. We all find ourselves in the midst of labeling who's right and who's wrong, who's lost, who's saved, who I think is all this stuff. And friends, it doesn't matter what you and I think. Because Jesus tells us that we're supposed to love everyone, no matter what kind of title you carry, no matter what kind of label you may have on, we are called to love each and every one. And I wonder what kind of labeling went on amongst these disciples of each other. I wonder what kind of uh, ideas they had of each other. When Jesus was just, he even prays for them at one point and says, you know, make us, make them one as you and I are one. And friends, we need to love the lost. I love the, the humility and the kind of self-awareness that the Apostle Paul has when it comes to this idea of needing to love the lost. He, he writes about himself to his young student, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 1.15. He says this, Paul writes this and says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy. So that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul says that Christ came to die, not for the perfect, not for the religiously elite, not for the holy, the pious. No, he came to save sinners. That's the far-reaching the beautiful and overwhelming love and grace of Jesus. And that's a powerful thing. You know, in the book of Revelation, the first two chapters of Revelation, we find that, that when John is given this vision of heaven, Jesus starts this vision, starts this moment by giving some letters to John to write down and to send to seven different churches. And, and we could argue whether or not he meant literally to send those letters to those little, literal churches. I really believe that those, that those letters were meant to be something bigger in a grander way to be letters to all churches, all of God's people. But within those, within those letters, every time that Jesus kind of had a warning or a rebuke or a lesson to teach those churches, he also followed it up with kind of a way of saying, but you've got a chance. You, you need to change. You need to do something about it. And if you don't, this is what's going to happen. He gives them a warning. Friends, I believe that Judas should serve as a warning for every single Christian, that it's not enough to just go through the motions, that it's not enough to just go to church. It's not enough to just wear the label Christian. It takes surrender. And, and your Lord and your Savior is waiting for you to surrender, to hand it over. Don't make the mistake of Judas. Don't harden your heart. Don't make it about yourself. No, take that time. Allow Jesus to soften your heart, to change it, and to surrender yourself completely to him. Let's pray. In fact, I'm going to ask you to do something right now. I'm going to ask everybody, if you would just put your hands out in front of you with your palms up. Many times, uh, different church traditions do this as a way of kind of a visual and a, and a personal way of us sort of reaching out to the Lord as a way of being in need and wanting to accept what he gives to us. And so, Jesus, we come right now with our hands open to you. 
showing that we have nothing to give you and we simply want from you. We need you. Lord, we look at this example of Judas today and we feel this, we see these moments of him missing the point and going through the motions and experiencing so much but never being changed. Father, may that never be us. We come to you empty-handed and we simply say we surrender. We surrender ourselves to you. And God, would you within each one of us right now, each person as we, as we sit here in this moment, would you, would you really open up our heart and our eyes and our minds to see those places that we have not surrendered to you, that we keep on holding back, that we keep on holding on to, that we allow to be in the way of our connection and relationship with you. God, forgive us for those times that we have, we have made it about us. We've asked, what will you give me? What will you, ma- what will you do to make it worth my while? And we give our allegiance to something else, to ourselves, to the things around us, to the people around us. God, help us to learn from Judas and his hard heart. May you soften our hearts that we would surrender to you and simply come humbly to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.